Broadcasting live from the School of Athens, this is Europe and the People Without History, everyone's favorite AP World History Review Service. Today on this episode with Mr. Olson, we're going to be talking about post-classical trade routes, their importance, their long-lasting influence, their similarities, and their differences. To get things rolling, how about you enjoy me on a camel? Alright, so uh, there are several essentials about trade that I want you to keep in mind, and I bet if you're in any AP World History class, you're probably sick about your or sick of your instructor talking about trade. So here are some uh, key things that I want you to keep in mind uh, throughout this presentation and for the entire year. First of all, trade has always been going on. Trade was a thing before the Silk Road. Um, wherever people have something that somebody else doesn't, there's going to be trade and bartering for it. So to think that trade just automatically poof appears in 600 CE, that's not not the case. It's always been going on. People have been interacting for a long time. Okay, goods travel much further than merchants do. So usually along the Silk Road first, we see that, that the goods are traveling uh, from stop to stop to stop with different merchants. Much like goods today, uh, a t-shirt in today's world is going to see much more of the earth than uh, humans will. And trade impacts the day-to-day -day lives of all people. So that means people at the top of the social stratosphere and people at the bottom. It is going to impact everyone's day-to-day -day life. It also shapes the structure of society. It transforms political life. And um, more than just goods are being exchanged. So one of the big ideas we're going to talk about now is that ideas, technology, uh, disease are all things that are going to be exchanged over these these routes. And then trade routes prosper most when large empires oversee them, make them safe, and allow merchants the ability to travel without being harassed by pirates and or bandits and things like that. Okay, so here's a map of Eurasia. Eurasia is a term that if you're not already familiar with it, you should be. It means Europe and Asia. Another term that you should be familiar with is Afro-Eurasia, which of course is Africa, Europe, and Asia. These are terms that, that are going to come up time and time again. The College Board loves to talk about Afro-Eurasia, so you're going to have to know what they are. Okay, so um, as you can see, the Silk Road, quote-unquote Silk Road, was not one road, and it certainly wasn't made of silk. It was a network of trade routes that included also water. But you can see that the, the water routes weren't that extensive. It, it, it didn't include Africa yet. We'll start to see when that gets enveloped. But when we talk about the Silk Road, usually we're thinking about what was going on over land and the trade that embodied mostly silk. That's, of course, why it gets its name. Okay, so to talk about uh, the, Sil the Silk Road, let's discuss first what it's connecting. It's connecting Asia and Europe. And during the time period that's most influential, it's connecting Han, China, and Ro the Roman Empire. So, like I said before, it's a network of trade routes. It's not only one road. And it did involve both land and water routes. However, those land routes were uh, more influential and much more traversed than were the water routes at the time. Okay, the participants are, like I said before, China, Central Asia, and Europe. So in Europe, we're talking mostly about Rome. And in China, we're talking mostly about the Han Dynasty. Now, it's important to keep in mind that Central Asian nomadic peoples were also involved in this trade. Why are nomads good traders? Well, they're good at moving around. And they're especially good at moving a lot of stuff around, which they do by nature of their life. So um, those people who live in the Eurasian steppe are super influential in this trade net network. Okay, goods that were exchanged, obviously silk. Silk was a luxury item uh, that was coveted by the Ro Romans. If you know anything about silk, it's spun from um, this substance that's secreted from silkworms of mulberry trees. And the Chinese held it closely and guarded it as a, as a state secret for many years. And as a result, it was in high demand and was very expensive for other people to buy because they couldn't make it. So the Chinese would trade silk for things like horses and precious stones, including lapis lazuli, which is pictured right here. It's a, a precious blue stone that you can grind into powder and turn things blue with. It's also popular amongst the Minecraft population. I don't really know what that means. But anyways, um, you also see the trade in tor tortoise shells that are gathered both from India and the Middle East. So have all these different items that are being exchanged. It's not just silk. Uh, now to in 
to kind of talk to Silk's importance, I have a quote here that was from uh, an influential Roman at the time, Seneca the Younger, who said, I can see clothes of silk if materials that do not hide the body nor even one's decency can be called clothes. Wretched flocks of maids labor so that the adulteress may be visible through her thin dress so that her husband has no more acquaintance than any outsider or foreigner with his wife's body. It basically means that silk do doesn't cover up much and is uh, kind of immodest. Now, uh, Rome at one point tried to ban the sale of silk, or the, the trade of silk, because it was causing a trade imbalance. However, it didn't work because wealthy people wanted it, and so they were able to influence the government. Nevertheless, there are always perspectives on things. Some people hated silk, even though it gives the name to the Silk Road. Now, like I said, said before, uh, you see the spread of other things along the Silk Road. So you see the diffusion of culture, things... Um, like entertainment being uh, Chinese entertainment that travels along the Silk Road eventually is going to be coveted in Europe and India. You also see the spread of religion, most importantly Buddhism. When Buddhism gets on the Silk Road from India, it's going to move into China and then it's going to influence China for years to come. One thing that's not listed here that, that uh, you're going to want to make note of is that disease travels along the Silk Road. The bubonic plague travels from China and it will eventually cripple the Byzantine Empire in the 500s. Another example of something that's a non-material item that travels along the Silk Road. So that's going to bring the Silk Road to an end. And now let's talk about the sea roads of the Indian Ocean. If you look at that map, you will see figured prominently in the ocean are the arrows that indicate the monsoon winds that make the Indian Ocean trade um, as reliable and effective as it was. Because the winds blew reliably in the seasons, it allowed for boats to travel uh, almost to the day on schedule with their goods, so people knew exactly when they were going to be getting things. Also, if you look at that map, you can see that instead of just Eurasia being included, you see Southeast Asia and Africa figured much more pro prominently into this uh, series of uh, trade net networks. So um, this trade network connected Southeast Asia, India, Arabia, and East Africa. So it was a network of sea routes. It wasn't just one road that connected two different places. Participants are uh, similar in that you have China, but different in that you now uh, have Indian empires, East African empires, including Great Zimbabwe, and then also Islamic empires that aren't listed there but should be, uh, that also played into uh, the Indian Ocean trade routes. Now, goods that were exchanged were much more diverse than that on the Silk Road because you're, you're getting Africa into the mix, and Africa has a vast array of, of nat natural resources that are not available in Eurasia. So uh, you, you get wood and things like that, and wood can be brought to Arabia where there isn't much wood, and you can now build things that you couldn't build, build before. Okay, anyways, you also see the movement of porcelain, ivory, gold, cotton. So some things are similar, but it's, it's much more diverse. Okay, now if I were to stop and talk about how these two trade trade routes, probably the most influential in wor world history, are different, we would focus on these things. There's more diversity in participants in the Indian Ocean than there is in the Sil Silk Road. Indian Ocean trade is cheaper than the Silk Road because it's more efficient. Since you can carry more things on boats, and since the boats travel more quickly and more effectively, and there's less of a da danger traveling on water than there is over land, it's cheaper to move the stuff, which is going to make the products cheaper, which is going to make for more trade and more people buying stuff and a more vivid and vibrant economy. Okay, boats are more effective than camels. I'm sorry, sorry to say they can carry more, so you can carry stuff that's not just a luxury good. You see environmental differences in the participants, which made makes the trade more lucrative because you have more stuff being traded in the Indian Ocean trade. The Indian Ocean trade is accelerated by the emergence of Islam and Islamic empires um, near the Arabian Sea that help facilitate and keep safe this Indian Ocean trade. Also, Indian Ocean trade contributes to the emergence of city-states throughout the region. If you were to look at a map of Indian Ocean trade, you'll note that a bunch of cities uh, emerge along the coast of India, along the coast of East Africa, and even in Srivijaya in Southeast Asia. I hear ways that it's similar to the Silk Road. There are similar goods being exchanged, always. Uh, of course, gold is going to be a uh, figure into both of them. You see the spread of culture and religion. Uh, Bo Buddhism spreads via the Silk Road. Islam spreads via the Indian Ocean trade. 
is also stimulated by powerful empires, which we, we said that about Islam before, but it also is improved by technological advancements in things like better ships or better ways of riding animals. So the camel, there are 15 different ways to saddle up a camel, and every saddle innovation means that trade is going to be made more efficient. Okay, here's a map of the Indian Ocean, and you can see, if you, don't, if you didn't believe me up until this point, that Islam makes its way from the Arabian Peninsula into parts of India, into parts of South Southeast Asia, and into parts of East Africa. So, like the Silk Road spread Buddhism, the Indian Ocean trade is going to spread Islam. Now, the third and final trade route to be discussed here is that of the Trans-Saharan. So if one were to take a look at Africa, you will note that its geography is dominated by greenery in the middle and desert at the top and at the bottom. Which means if goods are going to be traded between Europe, say, or the Middle East and the inhabited parts of Africa, the mo mostly inhabited parts of Africa, it's going to have to go across this Saharan desert. That's the reason we get the Trans-Saharan trade routes. They look like that, and you can see that it connected the people in North Africa, sometimes called the Berbers, to the people who lived in Sub-Saharan Africa, the great African kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai. So who do we have participating in this? Usually, basically North and Sub-Saharan Africa. So the nomadic traders who live in and north of the Sahara are going to be trading with the major African empires here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so we have these no nomads and the empires. Okay, the goods exchanged, gold and salt. Salt is pl plentiful in the Sahara Desert because it used to be an ocean, and therefore there are salt deposits there, and gold is plentiful in, in the Sub-Saharan African re region. That's why uh, empires like Mali and Mansa Musa were so influential and rich. Okay, so the significance of these tra trade routes and why you need to know them, it connected North Africa with Central Africa, which means that it's eventually going to connect Central Africa with Europe. It also allows for the diffusion of Islam. One of the important things to keep in mind is that those sub-Saharan empires adopted Islam largely because of these trade routes. Now, it also has the exchange of val valuable goods, which allowed for empires to, to grow. We see that in those West African empires. And then it also brought West African gold to Europe, which will eventually bring them out of the Dark Ages and allow for the Renaissance. So those are post-classical trade routes, and that is how we reach nirvana. This is your Buddha, signing off.